Good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our monthly uh, best practices toolkit phone call. My name is Travis Atkinson and I work for TBD Solutions and it is a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I know that we have even more first time um, participants with us and so we're excited to have you join in uh, on some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, just a friendly reminder, um, please go ahead and mute your phones uh, but don't put us on hold. Uh, we had an issue a few months ago where we were um, privy to everyone's, to, to someone's hold music. And uh, while it was uh, nice music, the timing wasn't helpful. So um, just make sure to, to, to go ahead and mute us, but not to put the call on hold. Um, also, for those of you who are on uh, the Skype link, that is where we are, um, that, that's where we're posting all of the, the, the slides that you're going to see us change through. Now, I also sent those out last night, so uh, you probably um, can, can click along at your own pace or along with us if, uh, you're not, um, if you're not able to connect to the Skype link. So, um, yeah, we're, we have a lot to talk about today, so I just want to kind of roll right into it. Uh, today, we are going to be, we'll, we'll be talking about two areas of focus. One is taxonomy. Uh, which kind of has some overlap to the, the scope and function conversation that we had a few uh, months ago, but uh, especially based on some feedback of, of our work group members is something that uh, we thought we should go back to and just spend a little bit more time um, understanding and, and diving into. And then we'll also be talking about uh, community relations, how your crisis homes um, interact with co fellow community providers and, and anybody, um, e e just really anyone in the community and, and, and how you try to uh, maintain your, uh, your profile or your image. Uh, we will have a guest, uh, Steve Michio from People Incorporated in, in New York will be our crisis home spotlight today. And we will spend time going over the survey results related to uh, taxonomy and community relations. Um, and then lastly, we'll review our project plan and timeline. Uh, so you can see our purpose there at the bottom of our, uh, our slide that we are looking, we're, we're, we're developing a comprehensive and best practice, a comprehensive best practice toolkit for crisis residential services that is informed by crisis residential providers across the country. Um, TBD Solutions is sponsoring the work that we're doing, uh, and we are proud to be sponsoring this effort. Uh, we do work in crisis program development and metrics development and a number of other different areas. And uh, we are helping uh, programs uh, in, our, in, in the Midwest to develop and enhance their crisis uh, systems of care and their crisis programs. Uh, you can find more about us on our website at tbdsolutions.com. I also wanted to mention for those of you that are going to the National Council Conference um, next month, we will have a poster session there that uh, was in a partnership between TBD Solutions and Hope Network uh, that has to do with some of the crisis metrics data, uh, the, the, the data set that we organized and be, began collecting last year for our crisis residential units here in Michigan. Um, if you're not able to go to the conference, you can actually still access the presentation or the poster because they're all being uh, put online this year. So if you have the meeting slides that I sent out, uh, you can click on that link there to view the presentation. Um, if for some reason you can't get that to work or if you uh, didn't get the meeting slides, just send me an email after this meeting and I'll be happy to send that along to you. Our work group is now over 100 participants strong, which we're very excited about. We continue to find uh, really great uh, providers that are interested in, in being a part of this work group. Uh, we added a few more states. We're up to 29 now. Um, and we also have participants from England and Costa Rica. Um, we have about 325 crisis homes nationwide at our last count. And depending on our conversation uh, related to taxonomy um, today, maybe we'll have more, maybe we'll have less. I'm not, uh, I'm not quite sure. Um, we want to welcome some of the new programs that have joined us from Montana, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Rhode Island, and England. We are glad to have you um, on the call. And if I missed any states or any uh, participants from uh, states, I apologize. 
Um, but we're glad to have you all involved in the project. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some interviews that I've done recently with uh, crisis homes in England. So uh, for those of you that don't know, this, this project initially started with some of the work that we've been doing in Michigan, and we broadened the scope or, or did like a little zoom out on the Google map, so to speak, to say, um, you know, what would this look like at a national level? And then a few months ago, uh, we asked the question, well, what does it look like at an international level? And I was able to find about 12 crisis homes in England, um, and I've had the chance to interview five of them. Um, and their model is very fascinating to me, and I, I think we should we should uh, spend some time at some point, maybe not on this call, but in the future, just talking a little bit more about um, like the history of our crisis homes beyond our own country. Uh, in an interview that I had with one of our crisis homes on the east side of the um, of the country, somebody had mentioned that their model was informed by um, some of the work that was being done in Italy several years ago. And I had thought that a lot of uh, our models would also have been informed by the work being done in England, but it sounds like um, their models, many of them, have sprung up in the last 10 years or so and uh, have been uh, kind of self-initiated, haven't necessarily uh, come from uh, from seeing another model in, a, in another country work. Um, th there are some different words that are used uh, when, when the, the crisis homes in England talk about their, um, the work that they're doing. Um, they use the, the phrase survivor-led uh, to talk about their crisis homes. Uh, so, they, uh, so similar to the peer respite homes uh, in our uh, country and the ones that we'll be talking about a little bit more today, um, they, uh, many of, most of the homes do not have um, any medical staff in the homes. So no psychiatrists, no nurses, uh, and they really, uh, the, the, the premise of their treatment is on relationship. Um, on being connected with people, helping them to feel welcomed and heard and understood. Um, most of the homes are, are that, that small residential model that uh, many of our participants uh, utilize. They're largely grant funded, which while it can be a, a challenge to get your funding, uh, to, to keep your funding streams, it also allows them a little bit more flexibility to um, be creative in how they uh, provide these services. And they're pr used primarily as a diversion from psychiatric hospitals and not um, as a step down. Uh, so there's, there's kind of this, uh, this pretty big separation between the psychiatric hospitals and the crisis homes. And they have a, a heavy peer support presence as well. Some of the homes are entirely peer run. Um, one of the homes has over 100, I want to say 150 volunteers uh, that pick up a few shifts per month and then one weekend shift per month. Um, and most of the homes also do not pass medications. Um, another interesting piece I found about the, the homes in England are that there's some of them that are not 24 seven. So they'll be open from 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, or, you know, they'll open during second shift and people can spend the night, but then they leave in the morning. And there's a very heavy influence or emphasis on uh, being, remaining engaged in the parts of your life that are important for you to, to continue along. And coming to the crisis home is kind of a, um, uh, a compliment, I guess, to um, the other parts of your life perhaps that are working. So I also wanted to, to shed a light on uh, one of the homes that I talked to, which is the Link House. And they have a really phenomenal uh, satisfaction survey uh, report that they, that they came out. And I'm going to jump over to it for those of you who are on, um, uh, who are on our Skype call will be able to see this. But, uh, and I also put a link to it in the presentation. Uh, but they basically are very transparent about their feedback survey uh, from the past, uh, from this, this most recent year. So they've got questions about, you know, if their stay was helpful, um, if they feel like they knew enough about the house, if there's anything that could have been done differently. Um, and I think what's great about this is not only are they transparent, but they keep very high satisfaction scores. And it really looks based on the length of this report and the, the depth of it, that they didn't necessarily filter out negative um, 
comments or feedback, but they just included all of it. Um, you know, there's, there's, they have a whole section about what was the most difficult thing about being in Link House, and they say the noise or having to wake up early. Uh, so just really cool to see a program that would um, be so transparent and so forthcoming with their information, and and just to make it public. Um, uh, I, you know, I think there there could be some great opportunities for um, for for our, for crisis homes in our state to take that kind of um, that kind of approach. In, uh, in our customer satisfaction information, I think it would uh, force, it, it would ensure the crisis homes that, that were, that they're really focusing on satisfaction. Uh, so any questions about the, um, the England crisis homes? Okay, um, if not, then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Steve Michio. Uh, Steve is the CEO of Projects to Empower and Organize the Psychiatrically Labeled, uh, which uh, the, sh the short version is People Incorporated. Um, Steve uh, received his uh, psychology degree from the uh, SUNY College at Plattsburgh. Um, he serves on the Psychiatric Rehab Association Board, as well as the New York uh, State Suicide Prevention Council. He's a CIT trainer. Uh, I had a chance to meet Steve last year at the National Council Conference uh, where he gave a, a great uh, presentation on the use of peer supports and crisis programs. Uh, so I want to turn the floor over to Steve. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. All right, thank you. It's good to be here. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can. Okay, great. Okay, I guess uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, the relationship and, and uh, why it's important just so you know who I am and, and what I do, I, I run um, and have developed a bunch of uh, respites uh, that are all peer run um, here in New York and across the country and in, in the Netherlands as well. And um, we've really followed a basic principle concept of uh, understanding how, how all of this works. And, um, you know, these are folks that are in crisis that get to come to our houses that get to uh, experience some on ways of thinking of the crises differently um, as they go forward, um, and, and how to avoid emergency room services, how to avoid um, hospitalization, and now that we've been so involved in crisis intervention training, we're even working with people on how to avoid jail, too, um, and we've been extremely successful in, in all, all those sort of components. Um, the, I can't speak enough to the importance of relationships. Um, we are born uh, from being a peer-run advocacy organization, and when I first started back in the uh, late 90s, um, it was a very adversarial advocacy uh, group of folks. We were very grassroots at that time, and kind of throwing rocks at the system and, and really um, upset with, uh, so many people we serve were so upset with the system. Uh, itself and, and um, trying to, you know, just navigate the system themselves and, and uh, get the quality of care that they deserved and that they wanted. And um, so we went from that to figuring out, okay, I think we've thrown enough rocks and I think it's now time to develop a system of care with the traditional providers. And you'll hear me use the term traditionals. Um, what, what I'm saying is it's a tradition. I'm talking about the traditional behavioral health system when I mentioned traditionals, but how to, how to move it, how to evolve the system, I think, is really where uh, I pushed and, and changed our philosophy in our organization um, that I think was really important because you didn't want to totally discredit a system of care you know, that, that has medication and psychiatry and treatment and different therapies and things like that, but at the same time, you wanted to evolve a system that um, really engage people differently and, and ask people what's what's happened to you, not what's wrong with you, not so focused on diagnosis, but more focused on the situations of people and, and what brought them to maybe that diagnosis or brought them to that crisis or those situations. So we started the, the first house back in 2001. And the first thing uh, the, in relations that, that I had to deal with was the community providers. And I was explaining the purpose of the house and what we were going to do. And there was actually one hospital there that said, uh, that was kind of upset and said, you're going to take all of our patients. And I said, well, I don't think so. It's four bedrooms. Um, I don't think we're going to take everybody. <laughs> we're just going to really provide an alternative to people. 
people and and also help them to avoid coming to the hospital needlessly because I think you know and we, we all know that a hospital is open 24 7 the first thing we think of in crisis is the hospital the emergency room and I want people to start to think differently not only about the house that I was developing but about the natural supports and community and using family using friends using uh, calling the therapist and having an appointment um, you know more rapidly than waiting for your next appointment things like that so we really wanted to complement the system and work with the system to make it work for the people in our communities. And so that was the one barrier. And then the other barrier was um, the issue that everyone thought that this was going to be for homelessness. And it's not. It's really designed for people that go from home to crisis to hospital to home to crisis to hospital. And I'm not able to break that cycle in a healthy way. And the houses were designed to help break the cycle, help people think differently about their crises. And there's, there's really the four components that make it work are, number one is that uh, the absolute belief in recovery and wellness, the absolute belief that people can do better for themselves given the education, given choices, and given that opportunity. The, the next is that it's how you engage and orient people to your service. You know, are you welcoming? Are you offering them information about your service? Are you telling them what your expectations of them, of the, you know, that, that, that are theirs, and, and what expectations they should expect from us as a provider agency? Um, talking about the service and what they're about to walk into and how it's going to run, why documentation is important. Very transparent. Um, and you were mentioning the transparency of the surveys. We do the same thing. We have a very, uh, looking at the survey, ours is extremely similar. Um, to make sure that we are providing good satisfaction for people that come to us. So that's, that's a relationship builder in itself. And then the next is the environment. What kind of environment do you have? Is it trauma-informed? Is it you know, a place where people feel safe? Do you ask the question, do people feel safe in those environments? And do you adjust your environments to help people feel safe when they're engaging in crisis or in, in you know, high, high energy situations? And then the, the most, I think, important piece for us, the magic sauce of the, you know, the secret sauce of that they say is um, it's the mutuality. It's that we have a lived experience of some kind of psychiatric care or some kind of psychiatric crises. And we're able to relate on that level with folks. And it builds trust and it builds a uh, relationship in a very different way than maybe a traditional system might. And it helps people to feel comfortable about opening themselves up to different situations. So given those components and then building relationships is the first thing I wanted to do is start to build relationships with our provider community so that when people came to our houses, they didn't have to wait for a clinic appointment. That they were going to be um, you know, engaged rapidly. Um, I, I'm one of those uh, folks that I, I constantly, when I go out and speak, is that I don't believe in discharge plans. I think they're horrible things. I think transition plans are better. I think direct connections and warm handoffs are better. And if we had a system of care that could provide all of that, we'd be much better off than, than where we are. So I try to develop those relationships where we can have that transitional plan. And um, that that is a lot of meetings and a lot of discussion and a lot of give and take with traditional providers on how to build that relationship. And we work really hard at that. One of the other relationships that we struggle with every time we try to open a house or open a house, the community comes out and they come out in force and say, you're going to, um, you know, I have children. That's the first thing I always hear in every public forum that I've, you know, opened the house in is uh, some parents will come up there and say, I have children. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I have children too. Um, but that's not what this is about. This is about <laughs> helping people that want help and to uh, give them opportunities to avoid those traumatic hospitalizations, those traumatic emergency department visits. And so we built into our, our and we're learning as we go in these zoning boards and how to work with them. So we bring a lot of satisfaction data. We bring a lot of data how we've avoided the use of emergency departments and first responders and uh, inpatient settings and what that saves the community in dollars. Um, we've learned to talk about how we make it safe and, and, and what our policies and procedures are because uh, we're not just this rampant, you know, open a house and let everyone come in and do whatever they want. We do have guidelines and we don't call them rules, but we call them uh, agreements, you know, between the guest and, and, and the, uh, our agency. Um, and, and so we work a lot and have to prepare a lot for zoning boards because you're going to get hit with every different question. Um, and I think what's helped us is we've gotten very involved in the police community and we work very closely with police and, and police generally do not you know, have to come to our houses unless there is a medical emergency or maybe a psychiatric emergency of some sort. Um, but it's very rare that that happens. And, and you know, in the last 15 years, um, I could probably count on maybe two hands and how many times we really had to have police um, work with uh, folks that were, you know, 
police comes because when you call an ambulance, police have to come in, in as well. And um, that's what makes it look like, you know, at, at times that it could be a situation at the house, but it's generally not. So that, that's a lot of work that goes into um, what we do as far as relationships. And then again, getting into the other provider community services, such as the ACT teams and the mobile crisis teams that exist out there now, we build very close relationships where we're going back and forth. Um, and the mobile team will bring people to our houses, or we will contact the mobile team to come in and maybe do an assessment if somebody's having a little more of a struggle than what we're used to or, or what we want to handle. We want to make sure that everyone is safe in that environment. Um, so we have very close relationships with them. And we have a relationship with the hospital itself, all the hospitals, um, where they will have someone in the emergency department and realize that this person doesn't need that high acute level of care and would they be interested in going to the rooms house? And so that phone call is made. We speak with the, the potential guests. We do the, the general, uh, 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 get the general information to do the registration, and they come right to the house, and it's a direct connection again. So I think what's important is that we've created something alternative that we know works, doesn't work for everybody, but it works for a lot of people, um, and we've built the relationships in that behind it. And what I've also started to do is I, I have my services embedded within traditional services. So we're there at open access. We're there in the hospital itself, in the emergency room. I have staff. In the mental health units, I have staff. In the On the road, I have staff. I have mobile peers, uh, specialists that are out meeting people in community. We have a 24-hour warm line um, so that people have access to somebody. If they can't get to the house, they have uh, somebody to at least talk to. So we have a lot of um, relationship building that we've done over the years um, to build the integrity, to build the respect, and to build the relationship that actually works for the people in our community. So that's a whole bunch of stuff I just threw at you in a little (laughs) short amount of time, but I didn't know how long I had to really talk. That's that's awesome, uh, Stephen. I'll open it up for questions in a minute. I had two of my own. The first one is, um, how how are your, uh, your homes funded? Uh, they're funded generally through the New York State Office of Mental Health, um, and it's deficit funded, so we get an annualized uh, funding for each. However, one county has also gone to their legislation and enhanced one of our houses uh, so that we can provide even more services, so the county legislation has uh, been a part of it. And now that New York State has moved to the Medicaid redesign and Medicaid expansion, we're now able to bill through Medicaid for certain people that qualify under the HARP or the... Uh, the, the, um, the Medicaid program that's been uh, uh, wavered here in New York. Okay, um, I, 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 we have a lot of. I'm sure we have a lot of providers on the call who are, for whatever reasons, are are kind of set in the structure that they have, whether it's, you know, having a psychiatrist on staff, um, having uh, a limited number of peer supports, just being in a model that's regulated by the state and by their funders. But do you have any suggestions or ideas on what providers can do to bring some of these principles and concepts of your peer respite homes into their currently existing systems, even if they can't do an entire, you know, redesign and, and, and recreate their home? Yeah, I've done a lot of uh, work in thinking around this and, and helping and to under, people to understand the, the, the concepts that we work from, which are not always medically based. And if I think if people would look at their hospital emergency rooms and the people that represent or that come into the emergency room and look at how many are really Medicaid or a medical uh, uh, model uh, situations, like they need their meds or they need um, some kind of a, a more intense medical intervention compared to who doesn't. So it's really who, who becomes your inpatient and who doesn't become your inpatient. And look at those numbers, and you'll probably find that two-thirds of the folks that come to your EDs really don't need a medical intervention. They need more of a, a, a social intervention or a relationship intervention that's going to help them um, to get through their crisis. And so that's, that's one thing to think about and look at. And then the other is to work with peer groups through having maybe some kind of town hall meetings um, with folks to talk about what is it that they can help provide um, in the traditional settings maybe to help people to start thinking about their lives and their, and their crises 
differently than what they've always thought about. I mean, many people are even kind of trained and educated in saying, I'm in trouble, I need some kind of medication to deal with my situation. And it might not always be the case. It might be a case of somebody just needing someone to listen to them, someone to support them, someone to offer them a different menu of ideas and services that can help to resolve a crisis um, before it gets to that full-blown crisis of you know really utilizing or needing an emergency department. Um, it, it comes down again to the relationships, and I think the, the more we can build relationships with the people served in the traditional community of behavioral health care and providers, uh, the better outcomes you're going to start to see. Excellent. Um, I want to open it up. Does anyone have any questions that they want to pose to Steve? Okay, Steve, thanks so much for sharing that information. I think that really um, helps to lead us into our, our taxonomy conversation a little bit more, but, but also just to open up our eyes to um, what, what have been compared to what, uh, what we thought of as non-traditional models, uh, really showing outcomes and satisfaction at a level that's uh, you know, at least as high, if not higher, than uh, what people have been receiving up to this point. So um, thanks so much for your time and for, for, uh, for, for sharing those inf that information about your homes. Um, I wanted to circle back to a question that uh, Helen uh, mentioned and that I missed when we were talking about the programs in England. Uh, she had said, you mentioned they open overnight but not during the day. Are the users doing therapeutic, therapeutic activities during the day? Um, the, so, so some of the homes that I talked to, uh, the schedule was fairly flexible. and. Uh, that, that can sound like a like an excuse, you know, like, oh, we don't really, you know, whatever people want to talk about. But they do that because it's in, they're intentionally trying to address people's needs. And so um, they might pull the group at the start of the day and say, you know, what are you struggling with or what would you really like to see a group on? Do you want it to be more recreational, more therapeutic, more psychoeducational? Um, but I believe in that specific home, I don't know that there were any groups that were happening during the day. Um, I think they really kind of took an approach of, of um, connecting people to resources in the community that they, could, that they could access during the day and that there was just more of a respite component, more of a, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, just, just getting away from your, uh, your situation or your circumstance um, and, and utilizing those eight or 10 hours that they're open um, and part of it might have been a funding issue as well that they just really, based on their, the, the, their donors or their, you know, w whatever funding streams they were trying to work with, that they couldn't, um, they couldn't be open longer than that. And so they, they tried to meet the community need as best as they could with, with the resources that they had available. So, um, okay, why don't we move on to our topic areas for today, and those are... Um, taxonomy and community relations. So as I mentioned, we, we kind of asked some questions in the first survey or first few surveys that we sent out about how your program functions. And some of you might feel like this seems a little bit repetitive to come back to it, but as we include more and more providers, um, I, I think that our, um, our understanding of um, terminology is important uh, as we try to figure out you know what we're building and who and uh, as far as the toolkit and, and who we're building it for so we went back to just some areas to be able to do some comparisons and say okay you know what's the what, what terminology are we using when we're referring to our services and what does that mean and does that vary from state to state um, and then there's some other areas which you can see on here about whether the program is locked versus unlocked the ages of people that are served, the length of stay, um, medication, uh, per, uh, who's prescribing medications, if anyone, uh, the, the presence of peer supports, uh, and so on. So 60% of the people who responded, and, and by the way, this month we got about 27 responses uh, to, our, um, to our survey. So the terminology used to describe the services, about 60% say that their services are crisis residential, or uh, and then about 40% say that they're crisis stabilization services. There are a few instances in which people use more than one term to talk about the same um, 
the same program. And so I want to um, just show you what understanding some of these, and I'll show you that in a minute once we get in a few more slides, but what this allows us to do when we really understand how programs identify themselves and, and what components might lead into that is it really just gives us a more in-depth understanding to say, okay, you know, crisis residential in Texas means this and crisis stabilization in Arizona means this. Um, as, as we try to kind of develop and come to some consensus on, um, you know, on what we're talking about. So when, when, when we ask the question about if is your, is it locked or unlocked, we offered three options, right? So one was an unlocked facility. Um, another one is this egress, so it's locked from the outside, but it's, it's, you can leave from the inside. And then the other one is that they're locked both inside and outside. So the majority of the crisis programs are unlocked, um, but they're, it's pretty comparable. Um, the, only 15% of the programs that we're talking about are locked both inside and outside. And as we'll see in a little bit, um, some of those are like the, uh, the crisis stabilization units, uh, meaning the ones that are less than 72 hours, oftentimes less than 24 hours. Almost 90% of the um, programs that we surveyed serve adults, and then almost 60% of them uh, serve the geriatric population, and many programs don't necessarily distinguish. And I, I don't know, I haven't found many homes, uh, psychiatric uh, stabilization or crisis residential homes for individuals uh, who are uh, 65 and older and that are exclusively for them. Um, I'd be curious to hear more about those if anybody has any, um, any knowledge of those, but, but many of the homes that are participating in our work group serve both populations and don't necessarily distinguish between the two. So when we talk about function of the crisis homes, this is something that Steve Fields brought up uh, in during his time talking on our call last month, where he talked about really understanding like what's the function of a home because um, they might on, on the surface we might all be doing the same thing, which is trying to help people stabilize from a, a crisis or a psychiatric emergency, um, but the the way that that's done looks a little bit different so like i mentioned about the the crisis homes in england uh there are there, there really aren't any step downs that come into those homes they're all diversions um and 92 percent of the of the crisis programs that we surveyed said that they do function as a diversion from a psychiatric hospital um 46 percent talked about diversion from jail and i know that this is an area that's getting a lot of attention um, arkansas is trying to develop a model right now with their crisis homes and part of that model um, involves um, significant uh, uh, collaboration uh, with the the department of corrections uh, to talk about how can we not treat our jails like a um, uh, like a, a treatment facility for, for mental, mental illness. So this is what length of stay looks like based on the, the homes that participated. So most of the homes have a three to seven day length of stay. Um, and then the next most popular, most prevalent was a, a seven to 14 day length of stay. And I tried to tease these out based on um, some some respondents mentioned that there's more than one program that they operate and so that, that this is what helped us to know okay so certain programs uh, like the ones that we've talked about in Texas are, are uh, like the extended observation units are 48 hours or less I believe and then you get into programs that, that function uh, that are a little bit longer so I want to skip over here to um, uh, what we can really do with this information um, that when we start to understand how homes refer to themselves, what their security level is, the ages that they serve, we can almost start to, to do some classifications that, um, you know, if you're in one state, it might just make sense, you know, you might understand your own programs that exist. But when you're talking from, from programs between states, it can be harder to understand like what the terminology is. So for example, like there's some homes that refer to themselves both as crisis residential and as crisis stabilization, or use the term crisis respite and peer respite interchangeably. And so, you know, being able to have this level of data is just very helpful to say, okay, we can really start to distinguish. We can really start to define 
what a crisis home is and even if they exist in different states and there's some um, there's some areas that aren't the same we can also see where they align and where they kind of come together um, so for those of you who are on the call who are a provider and you weren't able to participate um, it'd be really helpful if you went back to that survey and kind of gave us that information as I mentioned we've got about 95 or 100 crisis homes participating right now and the more information we have on um, kind of the, the breakdown or the understanding of what your program is like um, the better we can kind of classify and say this is what crisis residential means um, I, I, so in some states that I've that I've talked to the providers and I'll say the word crisis residential and they'll say no we don't we don't have that we don't have a, a crisis residential program because for example the word residential makes them think that it's a place that someone stays for a significant period of time you know more than a month uh, but they might have they might call it something else they might call it an acute treatment facility or um, or a crisis respite um, but when you when you start to di dig in a little bit more the function is similar um, so this, this, is, this just helps us to bring some clarity a little bit to um, what hopefully hasn't been too confusing, but just brings us, uh, has some implications for how we can uh, define the phrases and the terms that we use. So just a few other things on the taxonomy area. So 58% of the crisis programs reported that treatment happens exclusively inside the program. 89% um, of crisis programs utilize a psychiatrist, while 54% utilize nurse practitioners for prescribing medications. And that's a growing trend that we've seen certainly with uh, the shortage of psychiatrists. Uh, many crisis homes are trying to, to become creative with how they can get uh, medications prescribed. There were a few respondents that said that they're also using uh, physician assistants to prescribe medications. Sometimes primary care doctors might be involved uh, if they know the person and they're starting them on a, a, a like a simple medication, like a, a, an antidepressant. A, a, a antidepressant. And then 76% uh, of the programs have peer support specialists that work either directly in the home or provide support in the home from a partner agency. Um, and so, you know, that's encouraging. I think it'd be great to, to see that number go even higher and to have even more peer supports um, staffed inside the home. Um, but I was encouraged to see that, uh, that there was such a high number there. Any questions about what we've talked about as far as the taxonomy and, and the, the definitions of the programs before we move on to community relations? check Skype this time to make sure no questions came through which doesn't look like they did um, okay so then let's move on to uh, community relations and we're gonna have some providers um, sharing a few of their anecdote anecdotes in here too so this is by far the most um, information that we've had come in on a survey and part of that was because I set up a lot of the data to come in in more of a narrative section a narrative approach especially with the uh, the community relations area because I really wanted to know just more about the stories and the experiences of people and those can always be um, captured in a, a yes no box or a checkbox so the first question that we posed was about marketing tools and about 85% of the programs mentioned that they have a brochure to explain their services and about 70 a little over 70% uh, reported having a website um, for their program um, now the next question kind of confused a lot of people and I want to try and explain it as best I can so the question was do you take a public approach or a private approach to your marketing of your programs and I think what I think might have been confusing of that for some people is that many crisis homes um, are fairly regionalized in the services that they provide. So for example, in Michigan, there are about 15 or 16 crisis homes and they each have their own, their own uh, catchment area or their own counties that they work within. And I, I think this is, this is true for many uh, crisis programs across the country. Um, but when you're in that regionalized state or that, that setting, you don't necessarily think of the other crisis homes as uh, competition and you also don't often have to try very hard in order to keep your beds full or to seek out new business um, and so in that sense your referral sources might be might 
just be out of your hands and you don't really have the um, the control to bring in uh, new business. But we all we also know with the changes that are happening in our healthcare system that the payers that you answer to today um, might not be the ones that you answer to tomorrow. And so uh, that's part of why I posed this question is because I wanted to see to what extent do people or do programs really take this approach of um, of of trying to seek out new business, talking to health plans, um, talking to neighboring communities that maybe don't have crisis services, um, and, and, and just looking at, at, at how, you, um, how you take on the image that, that, that you're trying to convey, as well as um, letting people know about your service. So there were a few quotes that came in from the public side. They said, we'll accept all referrals, both internally and externally, uh, to increase census and attract new clients. And we want the community to be aware that we exist and what support we can offer. So, you know, Steve uh, earlier mentioned kind of this um, this nimbyism or this not in my backyard syndrome that happens with a lot of providers um, and and the neighbors, I guess, of the providers. So that can cause a program to want to maintain a private persona because they don't want to, uh, you know, ruffle feathers. They don't want to get people. Um, um, Upset about the programs, or, or thinking that you know something's going to happen to their children if there's a if there's a, a, a program or a crisis home in their in their neighborhood. Um, but I, I liked what this person wrote in their response about just letting people know that they're there, and maybe it's a service that a person can request when they're in the ER. And if they knew it existed, then they could have you know saved a lot of time and effort um, in their treatment. Uh, some some advocates for for the private side. Uh, so one one home said they turn away 40 to 50 percent of their referrals, um, so there's not really a need for marketing, um, and also some restrictions about not, be, not being permitted to market um, in, in uh, you know on a commercial level. Um, but then one person wrote both. They said that we're we're currently providing only services to a region. We uh, do public marketing but only to our region at this time. But in the future, you know, you think about, well, this this is what your crisis home is like now, but what's it gonna look like in five years and would it help to change, uh, you know, a change that approach a little bit. Less than 30% of the crisis programs make efforts to engage their alumni in activities. Um, for some people, it can be a, a risk issue or it can be a concern of confidentiality. Um, but there was uh, some really cool responses that came in from those that, that do uh, allow their alumni to engage. Um, and I'm wondering, um, Shelly, are you, do you happen to be on the call? Um, you, you, Jessica, your, uh, your coworker had ex shared some really interesting information about your alumni and community relations. And um, if you're on the call, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share um, some information about how you uh, serve or interact with your alumni. Okay, um, maybe we don't have Shelly on the call, um, and that's okay. Um, did anyone? No, I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm there... here. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I'm just <laughs> Shelly, do you mind um, just mentioning your uh, your organization and your role, and then tell us a little bit about your um, alumni uh, engagement? Sure. So my name is Shelly Mohang, and I'm the program manager for Turning Point Crisis Stabilization Residential Services. Um, and we are in Clarinda, Iowa, um, which is a little tiny town in southwest Iowa. Our program actually sounds very, very similar to um, the program that um, the speaker talked about. It, sound, it sounded very, very similar. But Jessica is our director um, for the house, but she also does therapy for our center. So that's what she's doing this afternoon. So um, what we do for alumni, um, or we call them, graduates, I don't know, really know what we call them, but um, there's a few things we do. We also have a crisis line. Um, we have staff at the house uh, um, 24 hours a day, even if we don't have clients. Um, occasionally we will be low census um, and we won't have any clients in the house for a day or two, but we still staff it um, because people can call the house or our crisis line 24 hours a day. 
um, if they're in crisis to help with ER diversion. Um, and that happens actually more often than we thought it would. Um, we actually have also have a open door policy. Once you have been in the house, if you're in crisis or just need additional support, um, you're allowed to come back to the house to meet with staff um, um, for extra support. Um, and sometimes they just show up to tell us when they're doing well, which we love. And then we also do a monthly community dinner where anyone that has come to the house, um, we do it the third Thursday of every month. And anybody who's come to the house um, can come back for a meal and we feed everybody. And it just kind of gives us a good chance of, um, we purposely kind of put it towards the end of the month because people tend to run out of their food stamps by then. So then they're getting a meal. Um, and then we also can kind of just touch base on pe with people. Um, we've had com people come to the meal who are doing really well, and they tell everybody how well they're doing, and it's a good peer interaction. Um, we've also had some people that have come to the house, and they don't seem to be tracking well or don't feel like they're doing well, so then that gives us an opportunity to kind of pull them aside and um, feel out how they're doing or make re make referrals as possible, or, or we've actually readmitted somebody after a, a dinner before. Um, so that's always, that's always fun. So that's just a couple of things we're doing. We've only been open for about a year, a little over a year. So we're still trying to come up with some, some new ways to get people back in the house. But That is awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Shelly, for sharing that. I really liked what you said about, um, being able to know when the people that you've served are doing well. Um, I really believe that that's kind of a missing link in a lot of crisis programs that, you know, uh, if the work that you're doing is deficit based in the sense that you're serving people who are who are in need, in emergency, in crisis, and they leave and they're replaced with other people who are in crisis, you don't always get to know the rest of the story. And sometimes it doesn't it doesn't go well after that. But it, it's really encouraging, I think, for staff. Uh, from the perspective of morale to be able to say, you know, hey, like what the, the help that we provided uh, was meaningful and it and it and it led to greater things. So I, that's just a really cool way to close the loop and to, to get some positive feedback uh, going to, to your program. Thanks. The other thing I should mention that we do is we follow those um, clients for up to a year. Um, so after their um, discharge, we actually, I liked what the speaker said too, is we don't call it a discharge plan anymore, we call it an aftercare plan. Um, so, because we continue to follow them. We also do a crisis plan with everyone before they leave, and then we keep a copy of the crisis plan so that if they call us in crisis, we already know what works for them, so we can pull those out of their file and kind of talk them through it. It also helps teach them to use their crisis plan when they're in crisis. If we say, remember when we did your crisis plan, <laughs> like you said, you know, those types of things. So that really has helped. It felt very unnatural and weird for staff at first, but then now that we're used to it, it's kind of a natural thing to pull that crisis plan out and look at it. Um, but we follow them. We give them a call um, a week after discharge, one week, one month, three months, six months, nine months, and a year. Um, so we continue to kind of just see how, how they're doing for up to a year. Um, kind of remind them that we're there. Um, we're also tracking to see, we're noticing about four or five months or where people kind of fall off and aren't um, responding to our calls or um, we've had to readmit them or those types of things. So, okay. like I said, we've only been open about 15 months, so we're still still learning. Okay. Shelly, you mentioned the, that follow-up, and I think that's awesome. Do, in, in last month, we were actually talking about outcomes. Do you use um, like a, like a, a measure, to, like a PHQ-9 or something, when you do that follow-up, or is it just narrative questions? We actually do a PHQ-9 um, on admission to the house and at discharge to the house. Um, we had, do not do them at follow-up, but we do have specific questions that we ask when we have a follow-up call. Um, and that is, I'm not going to remember them all, of course, but it's, um, have you seen your uh, family provider? Have you been back to the emergency room? If so, was it a medical concern? Was it a psychiatric concern? Um, do you have access to your meds? Have you been taking your meds? Um, okay. Have you seen the therapist? Um, those types of things. We very seldom, the other thing is we very seldom, we like to have boundaries, but we don't tell clients no a lot. Hmm. Um, 
for example, we've had someone who needed to get to a psychiatrist even after they were discharged and they didn't have transportation, so we went and got them and took them to their psychiatrist. Okay. Um, now, we have had to set boundaries with people <laughs> and say we're not going to take you to every appoint appointment for the rest of your life, but um, we, especially community dinners, it's important to get them back, so we also provide transportation back for the dinners and then back home after the dinner. Very cool. That's awesome. Shelly, thank you so much yep. for sharing that. that. That was really, really cool to hear. Thanks. So a couple other areas on uh, maintaining strong provider relationships. Uh, so from the access centers to case management to the, the hospitals and the EDs, these are some of the responses that we got about what contributes to um, really strong relationships. And, and being co-operated or co-located came up a lot. And I think it speaks to what Shelly just said about being able to control a little bit more of the continuum, whether it's access, whether it's um, discharge planning and, and having a crisis home that's also under the same umbrella that a case management um, team is, is under, um, that, that that's really helped. And, and being co-located too. So there is uh, one of our new um, uh, provider uh, work group members uh, has a crisis home on a, the campus, I believe, of a psychiatric hospital in Rhode Island, and they they're right next to each other. And so, like, you can't help but communicate when physically you're so close to each other. It it really breaks down some of those barriers. Uh, just some other pieces on on law enforcement and primary care clinics. Some of those uh, those keys to what's been helpful. Um, and actually, um, I believe, Jeff uh, Bracken, are you on the phone? Um, there, there's, you had mentioned uh, an open house as part of your uh, strong provider relationships. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit more. Okay, that is okay if Jeff's not there. Um, Mark, where are you on the phone? You could talk a little, a little bit about co-location of services. Yes, thank you. So, um, so the co-location, we do have uh, uh, we have three residential programs here locally here in Tarrant County. We have a uh, adult male, adult female, and then an adolescent program uh, with an average length of stay of about 20 days. And then we do have the other community relations. We have a call center that we also operate uh, co-located in the same facility with our mobile outreach team. Uh, so we do... Uh, uh, and a lot of our referrals come from our mobile team. Our call center gets the call that dispatches our mobile team, and then if appropriate, our mobile team makes a referral to our residential programs is how that works. Uh, we do a, a lot of uh, community collaboration. We actually uh, have, uh, for, for a number of years, a uh, very strong relationship, uh, community-wide, county-wide relationship here in our county. Uh, we, unfortunately, uh, were... Uh, experienced uh, one of the mass shootings back in 1999 at a Baptist church here locally. And immediately following that, the mayor and some of our, our leaders come together and we started what we call the Mental Health Connection, which is uh, open to all the county uh, agencies and uh, leaders and uh, meet the uh, second Monday of every month, have a two-hour program uh, where we come together and uh, kind of touch base and talk about uh, new and changes uh, within the county and things coming down the road, as well as having spotlight presentations on uh, individual services, uh, but most of all, just networking. And uh, just uh, last uh, last month, we had uh, three of our uh, largest uh, police chiefs uh, come and uh, do kind of a and a and a panel to, uh, to address the group and some of the uh, recent challenges with our local law enforcement and some of the national media with uh, interaction with law enforcement and mental health. So that's been a, a big thing to help bring our county together. Uh, we have a strong relationship with our county. We have a county hospital here within our uh, community that uh, we've had strong working relationships with for, gosh, at least a couple of decades, if not longer. Uh, do a lot of contractual work with them, uh, but they have an inpatient and a psych uh, psychiatric emergency room uh, that, um, uh, that we interact with. We actually have a liaison within our agency, our local community mental health, who uh, offices there on uh, their inside the psychiatric emergency center and then I have um, some other staff outside of my scope that uh, are up at the county facility where the civil commitments are done on a weekly basis and uh, decisions are being made for folks that need to go into our state uh, hospital settings here in the state 
so we had a long, long working relationship with them. Uh, we also, when we started our crisis redesign, we about 10 years ago, the state funded our crisis redesign services here within the state to uh, make available for everyone within the state a 24-hour call center, uh, mobile crisis teams, as well as uh, rest of residential programs. Our local med- medical or EMS system uh, reached out to us and actually spent um, a couple of weeks actually taking a day and, and their advanced paramedics uh, spending a day with our mobile team out in the field to get a better understanding kind of what we were seeing and what we were doing out in the field. And, uh, and then on a monthly basis, they have their monthly meetings where they have, uh, again, Q&A and uh, difficult case consults, et cetera. I have one of my crisis uh, staff attend those monthly meetings, so we stay in touch that way. And then we also have a quarterly stakeholder meeting where we open it up for any, any people that uh, uh, collaborate with us or have any information or a desire to learn more about us to come and uh, meet with us two hours once a quarter to get update on what we have currently going on within our crisis services with some data and numbers that we've served uh, in the last, uh, last 30 minutes or so for a networking opportunity. Great. Mark, that's awesome. I mean, it sounds like uh, you guys are just made to communicate because you, got, you have so many networks and, uh, and and you're co-located. I mean, it it would be hard not to uh, to have healthy, you know, to to to, to exhi- I guess exhibit uh, unhealthy uh, communication behaviors when you've got so many of those uh, uh, so many of those pieces built in. So, thank you very much for sharing those. Um, just a few other, we're, we're running a little short on time, but here's a few other stories about, um, uh, about programs and, and how they um, engage uh, members of their community. Um, just to give an update on uh, the project and what it looks like, uh, in addition to being a part of this meeting, um, you can also submit content through our surveys. Um, as we gather a little bit more information, we'll be doing more in-depth uh, content and editorial reviews as we start to, to build some of the pieces of the toolkit. And then uh, we'll also be tapping on some people's shoulders to do some state policy research as we get more into the, um, the pieces of why uh, certain um, programs are structured the way that they are in, in each state. Um, just to let you know, if you are attending this year's National Council Conference, uh, we have organized a crisis uh, providers meetup, um, and that is going to be Tuesday, April 4th at the Fountain Bar and Lounge at the Sheridan Seattle Hotel. Um, if you're interested in attending, please email me. Uh, this is not a sponsored event, but just uh, kind of a meetup that we've coordinated for crisis providers and friends, and I can send you the flyer along um, if you're interested. Um, Our next call is scheduled for Wednesday, April 19th at 2 o'clock Eastern, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, If you have a question that you want to email to the group, remember that you can use Crisis Residential Network at tbdsolutions.com. Our website uh, is where we have the meeting slides stored from uh, the last uh, few phone calls that we've had, as well as that we're now putting a recording of the call on there too. So if you miss them or your colleagues want to hear, um, they can go there and download it. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me. And uh, that is it for our call. Thanks so much to everyone who participated, and we'll talk again next month.